sit down and listen to more of that. That's kind of, kind of chill. Really nice. Hey, my name is Bill. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at Word Church. We want to welcome you this morning. And I don't know about you, but I found myself over this past week really focusing in on the news more so than I normally do because of everything that's been happening in the country. It's like the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I turn on that news feed and I begin looking at that. And you know what I realized over the last week? Your focus determines where you are in your spirit, does it not? Because you can get so focused on what's going on, you can despair, you can get anxious, you can get nervous. But I got a new place to focus. Because the other thing that I do in the morning is I open the Bible. I typically read a psalm, maybe two. This one hit me this week, and it couldn't have happened at a better time. Psalm 121 says this, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Our focus determines our spirit. So this morning, I invite you to set everything aside in that outside world. Set aside your to-do list. Set aside your calendar. Set aside your anxiety. Set aside that news channel, that news feed. Lift your eyes up. Focus on God, and we will get through this together. Not only will we get through it, but we can actually thrive through it. That's why we're here to celebrate this morning. We stand and celebrate with us.
It's good to see everybody here on this fine day. I have the privilege of bringing you some announcements today. Uh, first, if you are a regular member or not, we would love to know that you're here, and we have a very ingenious way to do that in COVID times. We have a QR code. Who doesn't? So if you can actually snap that from your seat, it will pull up a connection card that you can fill out online, 
Uh, if you can't quite get the picture up here, there's one on the door. You can snap that one. Just let us know you're here. It's also an opportunity to share with us any prayer requests or anything that you've got going on uh, that you might need help with. So if you check in, let us know you're here. We appreciate that. Also, if you are a regular giver and you're wondering how to do that uh, in COVID times, we have lots of options. So wordserve.org slash give, or there's a basket right over here where it says Welcome Center. This is so cool because you can put up a sign that says Welcome Center and automatically a table becomes a Welcome Center. This is how we roll. So uh, just put your uh, offering in there if you wish to give, and we will make sure that we use it for kingdom purposes and are good stewards of that money. Lots of things going on in the church, uh, especially as the new year unfolds. Let me cover just a few things that I find personally very exciting. Uh, tonight starts Next Gen. Next Gen is a youth group, ages, or excuse me, grades 6 through 12. And we meet uh, over in the gym right here starting at 5 p.m. So we're going to kick that off again this semester. Last semester, before we uh, broke for Christmas, we had 25 kids engaged in this. Why is this so exciting? Because if we get the next generation right, the faith will continue and thrive, and this will be a world that we want to live in. So that starts tonight. Uh, speaking of next generation, the generation before that, the kids, we are able to excuse them at this time for a kids' church. So if you would like your child through grade five to experience a children's worship time, Ms. Sarah is not uh, uh, objecting. She's actually going to lead the kids out. Uh, so. So that's it. I'm done with this place. I'm out of here. Uh, so if you would like your children to go to Children's Church, uh, follow Miss Sarah. And at the end of our time together, uh, you can go over to the gym right over here and pick them back up. So it's amazing. And these kids come out of the woodwork. Where did they all come from? This is an awesome problem to have. Thank you, Miss Sarah. All right. Uh, there are other things going on, one of which is the Epic of Eden Bible Study kicks off, uh, well, technically today. So people have been questioning or asking questions about how this works. Basically, the Epic of Eden is a 12-week study, and it is uh, one of the best studies I've ever seen that takes the Garden of Eden all the way through the, the New Jerusalem and ties it all together. It's primarily about the Old Testament. It's taught by an Old Testament professor uh, from my alma mater, Hasbury Seminary, and she does an excellent job of, of doing that. So if you are curious about that, it is not too late to sign up. It does kick off today. I would not hesitate, though, if you're interested in that. And the way it works is a video will be released on Sunday that will cover that next week. Now, we have limited storage space because of the way we're doing this, so there's only going to be three videos at a time that you can reference. So there will always be one rolling off, but you can look back two weeks. So if you have a group of people that want to do this and you want to start a couple of weeks later, that's all possible. So um, on wordserve.org, if you will click on the Epic of Eden or in the E! News, Click on, click on the Epic of Eden um, links, and you'll see everything you need to know about how to get engaged in the study, whether that's in person or online. And uh, if you miss it, you know, the study will still be out there. It's not the end of the world. Uh, but I do encourage you, if you're on the fence and thinking about it, jump in. Uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed at all. If you have any questions, let us know on that one as well. Uh, there are a few other things going on in the life of the church, but uh, I will just leave it at this. If you want to put your email onto that connection card, we will make sure that we get you on our e-news, which comes out every Thursday. That's probably the best way to, to keep track of everything that's going on at WordServe, because I can stand here all day and tell you the great things that y'all are doing, uh, but that's not what you came for this morning. So uh, I encourage you to put your name in with the email, and uh, we'll get you on our e-news list. That said, uh, we are a praying church, and it is time to pray. Will you join me in prayer, please? God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for the reason that we have to come together this morning, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the freedom that he offers. God, as we look at the world today, it is so easy to get our focus drawn in and our anxiety drawn up. But God, remind us that you are a God who is sovereign. You are in control. You're not surprised by any of this. As we approach this next week, God, I pray for our nation. I pray for our nation's leaders. I pray for a peaceful transition. Pray for your will to be done most of all. God, even in the midst of the turbulent times and the uncertain times, that's the times when people who follow you can shine all the brighter. And so I pray for those people who might be in, in the mainstream in the coming week, that you would bolster them, that you would strengthen their faith, that you would allow their faith to speak through them, and so that people can see you. 
that we pray for uh, all uh, our leaders in, in every capacity, whether it's federal or local. These are turbulent times, God. I pray for all our people as well, that we might be salt and light to the world, that we might be the light and a part of the story that you invite us to, the light that the, over, the darkness cannot overcome. So God, we give you our time, we give you our hearts, we give you our ears, and we ask that you speak to us today in a way that we can recognize. And let us be changed. Let us leave this place looking more like you than when we came in. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are uh, in a sermon series called Vision Map, and it is designed to take a look at going forward in 2021. As if anybody can possibly predict what will happen in 2021. I totally got 2020 wrong. I bet you did too. But uh, the vision map is designed to get us looking out and uh, looking ahead. Maybe how we're going to do this thing called church going forward. Last week uh, we gave the State of the Communion address. Uh, that was just a state of how things are in our nation and, and word serve. And I'll be honest with you, I had planned to talk a lot about more about word serve things last week. But that was before January 6th happened and, and the Capitol building incident happened. So I felt the need to talk more about the nation there. So what I've decided to do is we'll have a town hall meeting uh, somewhere in the next few weeks where I can go back and revisit more of the local word servisms. That'll be after church. And we'll let you know when that's going to be. And the thing I like about town hall meetings is uh, it gives us a chance to have a discussion. I mean, rarely do people interrupt the sermon and go, hey, I got a, a question, I got a point there. I hope I'm not planting any ideas. But, but nobody, like, stops me in the middle of the sermon and goes, what about, you know? So the town hall is a chance for us to discuss, not just me to talk at you, but to talk with you. So stay tuned for that. This will be coming up uh, pretty soon. Uh, this morning, though, uh, I, I came up with an interesting question. You know, if you ever want to know how to get to know people and what's important to them, I came up with an awesome question that you can ask. And here it is. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken and why? Think about that question for a second. If they're willing to answer that honestly, think about what's the biggest risk you've ever taken and why. The reason I love that question is, one, it'll immediately tell you what's important to them. What's worth it to them to take a huge risk? What do they value so much that they're willing to go up against almost impossible odds to get it? And it also uh, it is insightful because some people react differently to this idea of impossible odds coming against them or this, this great risk that needs to be taken. Some will be like this guy. Whoops, I shot right by him. <laughs> he really wants the cheese, man, but this guy has planned ahead. He's got a helmet. Right? He's going to be fine. So some people welcome the challenge. They'll step into that risk. They'll find a way to get her done. Uh, but then there are other people who don't really want to take that risk. And, and so what I find is uh, that, that here's a, a flowchart for you flowcharty type of people out there. There are really two kinds of people. This is rocket science, trust me. Either they will take risk or they won't take risk. I, you know, you can't make this stuff up. That's, that's just basically how it is. And there are varying degrees of risk. But here's what I find. As Jesus followers, we're called to risk. We're called to face impossible odds, to stand firm when we feel like in our heart we should run. Because that's the way that God works. If, if you don't trust me, uh, think about this. Ask Jesus if being Jesus involved any risk. Right? Once his ministry started, there was nothing but risk. And if that's okay, I can't really relate to Jesus. He's the Son of God. Ask any one of his disciples, hey, was there any risk involved in following Jesus? Yeah, there was always risk involved in following Jesus. Ask the Apostle Paul, the author of most of the New Testament epistles, hey, was there any risk in following Jesus? Yes, people beat me. They left me for dead. All the disciples died. Who wants to sign up? No hands, I see. Okay. Uh, so, so you fall in the no category. <laughs> I get it. But here's the thing. Great risk engenders great reward. And there is no greater reward than to usher in the kingdom of heaven. There's no greater reward than to be one with Jesus and know where my future lies. And experience at the same time in the present that sense of peace that is so deep 
but it's unexplainable. Great reward requires great risk. I know you know this. How else would a church this size build four and a half houses? I call it four and a half because the first half was like half the house burned and then we fixed half the house. Great risk, but great reward. There are four and a half houses out there that wouldn't be here if you all didn't embrace risk. That tells me a lot about what's important to you. To represent Jesus in the community, to serve this world, to learn the word. It, it makes me feel good to be a part of this organization because that's what you believe. That's what is important to you. So let's go to the Bible and take a look at this idea of risk. Specifically in 2 Chronicles, if you want to turn to your app or your Bible or whatever, 2 Chronicles is a good Old Testament uh, situation. I want to paint the backdrop before we actually get to read there, so that gives you time to look it up. And uh, at home, you can click on whatever app you're watching or, or using. In 2 Chronicles, we have uh, King Jehoshaphat. Now, there are a lot of kings in Old Testament Israel in, in the tribe of Judah. And it's pretty much, it makes, uh, pretty much a mix. In, in the northern kingdom, uh, there's really not a good king to be found. But in the southern kingdom, it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, right? But King Jehoshaphat's actually one of the good guys. He's trying to do reforms. He's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to take down the, the uh, other worship and, and other cultures, uh, religions, and bring people back to God. Now, there's some bad news that he receives one morning when he wakes up and finds out that there's a coalition a mighty army that has formed, and they're right outside his doorstep. Uh, it would be the equivalent of somebody coming to us and saying, hey guys, I just learned that the town of Houston, San Antonio, and Austin have formed a coalition. They have uh, 15,000 military people armed with spears and clubs, and uh, they'll be here tomorrow. Go. And what are we going to do? Oh, I'm probably going to panic, right? I'm, there's a lot of people that are going to be afraid. And this was what King Jehoshaphat is, is facing at this time. This is the news that he got. So I want to go to his prayer, which is actually in 2 Chronicles 5 through 12, and see how this leader, who was trying to do right by God, reacted when he got this really bad news. So here's what he did. Starting in verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. And here's the verse I love best of all. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This is the word of God for the people of God, and for this we are grateful. There's a lot of lessons to be learned here from Jehoshaphat's reaction. <clears throat> a lot of things that, that we can uh, incorporate into our own lives. And the first thing is, if you notice, King Jehoshaphat is following a very familiar formula. We just talked about this last week. The first thing out of his mouth as he stands up in front of his entire nation is what? God is. Not Man, there's a lot of people out there. We should run. You should hide. Let's all be afraid. No, he starts with who God is. God is the one in charge. God is the one who can make this go away. God is the one who promised them the land that they're in. God is the one who has their back. That's where he starts. 
It's a good place for us to start, too. You say, Bill, you said that last week. Yes, I did, but it was a different person. And you know what? I'll say it next week, too, because we're going to talk about it again. Read any psalm. Any psalm starts off with God is, and then all the woes and the trouble, and generally ends up with, but God is. A reminder of God's character and the way that God will carry them through. I keep emphasizing this because I think that's the first thing that we forget when we face trouble. The first thing we forget is that God is. I want to hang on to that firmly, especially because we don't know what 2021 brings. We made it through 2020. Let's see what happens. So this idea of uh, God is, is central to our belief, our faith. The other thing that Jehoshaphat does is he trusts God. Now, I didn't read the, the fullness of that chapter, but if you go on to read, you're going to find out what happens as Jehoshaphat and the nation of his, uh, his nation uh, falls down and worships God. So here, in a nutshell, is what happens. He hears from God that this is my battle. I'm going to fight this one for you. Now, human reaction might be, great, I don't have to do anything. That's not what he does. He falls down in uh, fasting and prayer, the king, and he calls his entire nation to do the same, and they do it. Now, can you imagine the entire city of Fulcher? Someone said, the mayor says, hey, we need to pray and fast. And not a single person goes, uh, you know, probably doesn't fit my schedule. Uh, you know, my diet doesn't allow that. Uh, no, you know, everybody doesn't without exception. Furthermore, Clayton, you'll love this one, he appoints a certain squad to sing. Right? This is, this is your job, is to worship God, to sing praises, to, to let the people hear your voice in praising God, to remind them of who God is and that we can trust this God. Never in my wildest dreams have I seen a military organization chart that had the band down in front. ministry all right so this is this is what they, this is the way that they're thinking now here's the tricky part as they're doing this he hears from god and god tells them i need you to go out and position yourself meaning the army and the band and position yourself in the face of this overwhelming military force that has been arrayed against you I need you to position yourself. I'm going to fight the battle, but I need you to go outside the wire, outside the protection of your city, outside everything that's familiar, and I need you to stand in this place. That's what I need you to do. I would almost have God rather tell me to go and fight, because at least I feel like I've got some control of the situation. You want me to do what? You want me to go outside like, like I'm not protected anymore and stand in front of this vast, overwhelming army with my band and stand there? They do that. That's trust. Now, here's the other thing that involves. There's a risk there. He's way overwhelmed, and he's way outside his protection now. What happens if they decide to, to, to lay on to him? They're done. And I mean D-U-N, done. I'll let that sink in for a second, right? <laughs> done for. Done over. No more kingdom. There's nothing left. They have no reserves. So here's what happens. God does what God does and confuses the enemy and sets some ambushes and they end up fighting each other. And there was massive slaughter from each other. They never had to fight a single person. The enemies got onto each other like a giant fur ball and didn't stop until everybody was dead. How amazing is that? And here it gets better. Not only did they not have to fight, but all these people they kind of brought some stuff with them. So they went out and gleaned the resources like God told them to do. They profited by standing out there and watching. You can't make this stuff up. This is interesting. So God is, trust God, and risk for God. This is a formula that I think is valuable as we approach 2021 as followers of Christ. And we'll see how it plays out uh, in a little bit. But I do want to ask... Um, if you are this person, if you are the risk person that says, yeah, I'm willing to take a risk, uh, 
that tells me a little bit about you, and I like you already. But let me ask you this. What's your motive? That's why I said earlier on when you ask somebody what's the greatest risk you've ever taken and why, the motive becomes super important. Because we can risk a lot of things, and people do. You can risk your finances. I knew a guy that had a, a, a shall we say, a gambling problem, and uh, we had access to Las Vegas on a regular basis in our squadron. We deployed once a year to a thing called Red Flag, which happens to be at Nellis Air Force Base, which happens to be at Las Vegas. This guy's strategy to fund his kid's college, at least as he told it, was the craps table. I don't have to tell you how that worked out. Right? I think he's still delivering pizzas somewhere. That was what he was willing to risk. I saw other people willing to risk relationships, and maybe you have too. I think that grass is always greener on the other side, isn't it? Until you get there and find out it's just weeds. Kids do this in school. What are you willing to risk to fit in? Are you willing to fit into that popular crowd by doing whatever it takes? Is that a risk you're willing to take? There are reasons to take risks. There are good risks, and there are bad risks. So what we have to do is figure out how do we differentiate as Jesus followers what's a good risk to take, and here's an easy way to do it. Seek God first. Again, this isn't rocket science, but it's sometimes just good to remember. Before I go and assume a risk, I want to seek God first. And then if the risk makes sense, take it. If the risk isn't something that would honor God, don't take it. Let it go. That's pretty straightforward, at least in my mind. Now, here's the, here's the more tricky one, because this isn't a stereotype, but a lot of people of faith are not huge risk takers. They, they fall under this no category, because after all, if I don't risk anything, I can't lose anything. If I don't risk anything, I won't get hurt. But so here, here's the flowchart for if you are a no person and you call yourself a Jesus follower and you don't want to take risks, here's the flowchart. See God first. God may say, no, you're right. That's not a risk that I need you to take. No need for that. But God may say, I need you to remove yourself from your safe walls and position yourself. Now, I will fight this battle, but this is where I need you. I will build this house, but this is where I need you. I want my people to be a beacon of light in a dark world, so this is where I need you. And if you don't think following Jesus is risky, and uh, uh, the other questions that we've already asked, here's one. Try talking to one of your friends about Jesus. Is your pulse quicken already? Try inviting one of your friends to church for a Bible study. Does that make your heart palpitate a little? But it's exciting, right? It's risky. What will they think of me? Are they going to call me a Jesus freak? I've been called worse. But some of you, actually, no. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Just see if you're still with me. All right, so what we have to do in this, in this uh, because we, we, <clears throat> we've pretty much determined that if I'm going to follow Jesus, <clears throat> I'm going to have to take risk. So, Here's my advice. Rather than wait for the monumental risk that it's like everything's on the line, why don't we practice a little bit first? Why don't we learn first how to seek God? I know for me, when it gets busy, some of the first things that go are prayer time. Uh, maybe I read scripture a lot because it's my job, frankly. I have to. If it weren't for that, I doubt I would read as much as I do. But you know what I don't do? What I find myself doing is I'll, I'll get in here and I'll go, see, how, how will this preach? How will this teach? The last thing I do is, how does this apply to Bill? That's what drops for me. Is it for you? I think this is a great time for us to learn how to seek God. How do I do that, Bill? Well, King Jay offers us a great alternative. Seek his face. Pray. Fast. Get a group around you that will do the same and support you. These are nothing strange to word serve. You know what this is all about. If this is new to you, I encourage you to explore that idea. Spend some time. Seek God. Practice seeking God before it's all or nothing. The other thing I would recommend is that we also learn to trust and risk, just like Jehoshaphat did. 
would start small. Again, don't wait till it's all on the line. Learn to trust in, in, in uh, risk on the small things first. I think that's the way that God works. A lot of times he'll put things in our lives and we'll go, this stupid thing, ah, these kids, ah, this whatever, you fill in the blank, this job, this relationship, whatever. Could it be that these are designed to strengthen our faith? Could these be learning opportunities where we're learning how to trust and risk in a God? And if we take them that way, we get better at it. But if we just, ah, I can't wait to get past that, I just push that past me. There's no lesson learned, there's just me blocking that out. And so that the next time it comes along, it's like it's starting all over again. I have no reserve, I have no skills in how to seek God and how to trust God and how to risk for God. So I'm not encouraging you to go out and get in trouble. I'm not encouraging you to take unnecessary risk. What I am saying is when there is an irritant in your life, perhaps that's a chance for a workout. Perhaps that's a chance of preparation so that we too can become people like Jehoshaphat's people were. Because with great risk comes great reward. And that's what God wants for us. I'm, I'm firmly convinced. So, as a way of remembering this, maybe, I have two things I want you to, to, to take away with you. The first is a key formula. Seek God before risk. If you ever get that backwards, you'll know it immediately. You seek risk before God. It's it, what we call uh, is that uh, self-evaluation, self-critiquing. Right? You'll know pretty quick, uh, okay, that was the wrong decision. Seek God, then seek risk. That's the key formula, the key question ask is, will this honor God? This risk that I'm about to take, that I think maybe God wants me to, will this honor God, or will this dishonor God? That's a key question to ask, and if we ask it right, I think we'll get better at it. Now, I know you can't read this. This is an eye chart, but I, I did this because I want you to know that at WordServe, we take this very seriously. This is the WordServe uh, vision frame illustrated, and it is available if you want it. Uh, actually, I think it's still on our website. I should have looked. If not, we've got it for you. But what we have here is a list of what's our mission. On the right side, what is our values? On the lower left, what are our life marks? Which means if I am living like a Jesus follower, I should see some of these things. And then the strategy circle, which is probably the more memorable one because it's pictures, and, and who, everybody loves a picture, right? But what you can't see maybe uh, is, I'm going to walk over here because I can't see it either. Well, I'm getting old. <laughs> so, on the values, number three, risk taking as sacrificial worship. That's a value that WordServe's lead team upon its foundation said this is important enough that we're going to write this down. We need to take risks as a form of sacrificial worship. And here's my favorite, look up at the top of the list of values. Seeking God's will as our first priority. See, it's almost like the founders of WordServe were in cahoots with King Jehoshaphat. Seek God's will as our first priority. Take risk, but do it as sacrificial worship. Taking a risk for God is, in, is a form of worship. Now, sacrificial worship, that's the word that gets in the way for people sometimes, isn't it? Because that means I'm going to have to give something up. Maybe they will think of me differently. Maybe I don't get invited to the Christmas party. Maybe I'm not in all the inside jokes. Maybe I'm not in the in crowd. But I will take being in with Jesus over any other of that any day. That's a risk worth taking. So I just wanted you to see that. Uh, I want you to know that this is available. There's more to it and probably wouldn't be a bad idea for us in 2021 to preach our way through some of the life marks and the values so that we as an organization and a culture understand the common thread that brings us together. The common thread that the founders of WordServe thought were so important that we wrote them down. That will follow uh, in 2021 later. <clears throat> but here's what we can't do. The biggest risk a person can take is to do nothing. This sounds like a you know something you would find on a motivational poster, but you know it's true. If you think about it for just a second, 
How many people here invest? Awesome. What happens if you never invest and you just put your money in a bank, or better yet, just put your money in a hole in the ground? What happens? You don't lose anything, or, or do you? Investors, do you lose when you put your money in a hole in the ground? Yes. yes. Because you do nothing. In the meantime, there's interest to be gained. There's other things going on in the world. In a spiritual sense, this is what Jesus said to the parable of the talents guy. You remember this parable of the talents? The one he gave one to? What did that guy do with that one talent that he gave? Buried it underground. And when he came back, what did he call that guy? You lazy, wicked servant. And what did Jesus do? Not only did he not lose, you know, hell, I didn't lose anything. I gave back what you gave me. You know what? I'm going to take that away from you. I'm going to give it to the person who made something out of the opportunity. This is right in line with Jesus thinking in that part. Uh, that kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of my head a little bit, doesn't it? We can't afford to do nothing. And here's in the spiritual sense. So you understand the investing part, right? Because the cost of living and everything goes up, and if I don't invest and don't get a return, I am going to lose. But here's how it matters in the spiritual sense. Whether you believe in an organized enemy, whether you believe in chaos theory, whatever it is, you cannot deny that there are people taking very great risk against very ungodly values in the world today. They're willing to risk anything. Many of them have no morals, so it doesn't matter. They're willing to make great risks for what they believe in. And in the world sense, they get great reward. And so it should be no surprise that we see a culture that is getting darker and darker. Left to its own, this world, do you think it's going to get better or do you think it's going to get worse? If, if every Jesus follower never said another word, if every Bible was removed from every shelf, would this world get better or would this world get worse? I'm assuming that because you're in this room, you probably believe that it would get worse. History shows that it will. You can read the Bible. You can look through any history. Where God is absent, trouble is great and gets greater until checked. Who checks it? Us. Don't wait for somebody else. Assume that it is my job to be a bearer of good news. It's my job to bring truth, absolute truth, to the world as God sees it. But at the same time in that truth, I bring grace because that's the way God brings it. You can beat someone over the head with truth, but until they see grace, until they see forgiveness, and this is your chance to come in and belong to this thing with me, with us. And it's not my doing. You don't owe me a thing. But it is his doing. And we owe him everything. What we can't do is we can't do nothing. We can't idly sit by and, and look for comfort. We can't idly sit by and refuse every risk that comes our way because of what people might think or people might say, or maybe this will cost me whatever. If we want this world to be a place that, that we want our children or our grandchildren to live in, we must risk. We must risk for the kingdom. We must risk for Christ. No doubt, uh, this world that needs Jesus needs everything that he brings. I, I have no doubt of that. The doubt that I have is, am I capable of bringing it? If, if I rely on myself to solve the world's problems, I'm convinced that I can't do it. And you know what I say to that? Good. Because if it were up to me, we would all be in big trouble. It's not up to me. It's up to God, the one who says, I will fight this battle. This is my battle to fight, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to position yourself here. And then watch. Watch what I will do through you. The enemy will be laid low. Way will be made straight, hope will return. We can't do nothing. But let me say it another way that might make it more striking. If we risk nothing, we'll lose everything. Let me say that again. If we risk Will not let that happen. He will return at some point, and he will make things right.
right. I read it to the end of the book. But here's my question for us today. Are we willing to wait for that to happen? Are we willing to say, I don't want to take the risk because I'm going to let God do it all? Or are we willing to position ourselves and let, the God, let God fight the battle that is before us? Because how many people between now and when Jesus comes again are going to suffer if we don't? And oh, by the way, that includes us. If we do nothing, we lose everything. But if we risk for him, gain everything. Make your choice well, Lord, sir. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for one willing to risk his life. Thank you for all those faithful individuals who have done so throughout the centuries to bring a gospel of peace, to deliver this book or, or this app that we have in our hands. God, forgive us when we treat it lightly as though it has no power. Forgive us when we treat it as it's an inconvenience, something that gets in the way and we don't have time for. God, help us to understand that this world needs what you have, and you have invited us into this journey to be your spokespeople. You have placed in our hearts an understanding of who you are by the power of your spirit. You have opened our eyes. God, help us to open our hands our mouths to serve you, to praise you. Help us to open our very lives that wherever we go, we might take you with us, whether that's with words or with actions. Show us the right thing to do. Help us not be content with taking risks of this world that do not honor you. And help us not to be content in taking no risk at all. But God, help us to have a sober understanding needed in this world, that we would trust you, that we would seek you, that we would position ourselves and let you fight the battle. God, we give you everything we have because you first gave to us. We pray this in Jesus' name.
things like this, your pulse quickens, your eyes dilate a little bit, and you get excited about what's out there because we serve a God who is big enough to handle anything. The God who will fight for us, all he asks of us is that we position ourselves. So go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Position yourself to seek God and take risks that honor God and watch the world change around you and watch yourself change in the process. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.